Oh, morning, Lakota. <laughs> I can't see you all, but I hope you're all doing well this morning. A kapai te ahua nei kua tai ki te wā hei whakatūwhera i tō tātou hui. Nā reira, uh, kua riro māku hei uh, taki paku karakia ki a pai ai te haere o tā tātou hui. Uh, nā reira, uh, kia taunga manā ki tanga te mea ngaro ki runga ki tēnā ki tēnā o tātou. Kia māhea te hua mā ki hikihi, kia toi te kupu, toi te mana, toi te aroha, toi te reo Māori. Kia tūturu ka whakamaua ki a tīna. Haumie, huie, tāie. Tūrua kā tika ki a haere tonu ngā mihi ki a koutou katoa. Uh, e oku rangatira, koutou e noho mai ana ki tērā kokonga, ki tērā kokonga. Uh, kā nui te mihi, koutou ngā kaimahi o te krauna. Koutou wetahi e mahi ana mo te iwi. I te taha o ngā kaunihera aroha rā nei. Uh, koutou katoa, no mai, hara mai. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm, I'm aware it's quite a large group this morning, so it's uh, not at all intimidating, but uh, very good to have you along here today for this uh, very important kaupapa and um, looking forward to the to the session. Um, so just also would like to acknowledge our mana whenua groups, uh, Puta Noi Te Motu, uh, Mohi ono, Kei Konei, uh, Sheridan, me wetahi atu Sheridan Waitai, uh, no Ngāti Kuri, e tikana ki mihi ki a koe, uh, e te tuhi mā reikura ka nui te mihi atu ki a koe. Uh, koe uh, ko tau rā e pupuri ana i te, te mana me te mauri me ki o Y262 ka mihi. Um, look, I just on behalf of Manaki Whenua and everyone participating in this kaupapa, a very warm welcome. Um, I'm going to just before I hand it to my colleague Manpreet, I'm going to um, ask if uh, my my colleague uh, Sheridan Whiteye, on behalf of Ngati Kuri, uh, might want to say a few words uh, just before we kind of kick off on the formal agenda. So Sheridan, kāri o te mohi o mehe mea kei ko nei koe, engari kei a koe te wā i, I nai nei e wā. Um, sorry, you can't see me, but kei te pai, feel a bit of a Yeah, so morena koutou, I'm excited um, to, be, to be present with you all. Um, so I'm from Ngāti Kuri, um, which is right up at Te Reri Ngā Wairua. Uh, and I'm also on the Taumata for Y262 and part of our mahi is to uphold the integrity and the real intentions of, of that claim. Um, and so I was I was really excited to see that this kaupapa was coming in, into the fold and getting um, some real visibility because at the heart of Y262 is our genetic resourcing and our genetic materials. Um, and so the, exploring these these wānanga kaupapa and actually setting up an advisory group to inform inform the library, um, the DNA reference library will, will help guide us in what I see as how do we protect uh, the mana of of our taonga and their genetic makeup um, of which we derive our mana from, and so understanding that they're both pros and cons. And the mahi that that we are all doing, um, but but within that, how do we keep front and centre in our minds and in our mahi that we put our hands to, is really thinking about what is that mana and how are we protecting that 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 faka papa, okay? and that faka papa is really really important to us as Māori because that is where we derive our own well-being and our own hauora. So if we, we start tittling with it too much and lose the original DNA or the original makeup of a taonga, we essentially lose a bit of ourselves. Um, so, so yeah, my, my thoughts are with you, my tautoko is with you, and I'm really looking forward to exploring um, 
just the opportunity that we have having such awesome heads and heads and hearts and hands around a collaborative table. So um, yeah, kia ora. over to you, Holden. Kia ora, Sheridan. Thank you for those, those uh, very useful words. And um, thank you also for just reminding us of why we're here today. So um, and I, I just might add that um, we're looking forward to you joining us for a more detailed session at one of the future workshops. So uh, you're still on mute, my friend. Thanks, Holden, Sheridan, for the words of support. I'm just going to put up a very quick slide just to give a little bit of an introduction for the project before I hand over to our facilitators for today, who are Susie Wood from Cochrane and Sean Wilkinson from Wilder Lab um, for today's session. Um, very, very briefly, one moment. Let's see if I can make this happen. All good. All right. Um, uh, kia ora koutou katoa, ko manpui tāmi tako ingoa, ko kairanga hau, ana a manaki whenua wahi mahi. Hello everyone, I'm Manpui Tami and I'm a senior scientist at Manaki Panama Landcare Research and I'm co-leading this co-papa with uh, the National Science Challenge Project with Holden. Thank you everyone for joining in today. This is the very first session in a Wananga series that is tasked with creating space for the conversation. So for the very important conversations that we're going to have around what the best practice within a Te Tiriti guided national science a national reference resource should look like. We are at the very start of this mahi, and so we're looking forward to having conversations with around all aspects of this project, from technical all the way to thinking about how this data should be governed, how um, what level of um, sovereignty around the data sets we can um, realistically and and um, you know with everybody in the room develop and generate. And we believe that these conversations are important and extremely timely. We've had such a good response um, in terms of participation. So that tells us that these conversations are really needed. Um, and these are also timely because we are facing issues of a global nature that require that the generation of these types of resources to enable us to address um, these issues with, with, with all the information that we can get. So today's Wananga is going to be chaired, as I mentioned earlier, by um, Dr. Susie Wood and um, Sean. And is about the end users, the, the ways a national library resource can be utilized to solve problems. And with that, I will, uh, oh, just one quick note. Um, while Holden and I are um, leading the project, we have a, an extensive group of um, uh, that are helping us develop these ideas, develop um, contributing their thoughts and their copa to the to these um, workshops, and and their names are just on the slide right now. Um, and yeah, with that, I would just like to pass it on to. I'll stop sharing, and pass it on to um, Susie. Kia ora, um, thanks, Manpreet. So, uh, kia ora koto, ko Susie Wood Takuenua. Um, I'm a freshwater scientist and I've been working in the, the field of eDNA for around about a decade. Um, so, yeah, thank you all very much for sharing your time this morning. Um, it's really exciting to see that the development of the field of um, eDNA and environmental DNA. And I, I guess many of us have known the importance of reference databases for, for a long time, but um, I think these have been developed in an, an ad, hoc, ad hoc kind of way and often not following best practice. So it's, it's really, really great to see this project initiated and, and some of the other efforts that are um, going on around the country in this space. So this morning we have a really amazing um, lineup of speakers. Um, it is quite a packed agenda. So I'm gonna ask if you would be happy to hold your questions um, till the end when we've got um, a really good amount of time to have a hope some you know, really insightful discussion but feel free to, um, to put those in the in the chat so you don't forget them and, and we'll come back and, and revisit those as we go. And so each of the speakers has 10 minutes and just to the speakers, I'll, I'll give you a one minute heads up when you've got a minute to go so that I can and try and keep you on time. Um, yeah, so really excited to introduce our first speaker, which is um, Dr. Sean Wilkinson. Um, he's the 
the founder and director of Award Lab, which is a, um, you know, an amazing commercial um, um, eDNA facility, which I'm sure he'll tell us more about. So um, Sean, are you happy to, happy to share your screen? Sure, thanks, thanks so much, Susie. I'll just uh, get this up. Um, all righty, used to, used to Teams, sorry. Um, share screen, here we go. I get a thumbs up from you, Susie, if that's uh, all coming through. Excellent. Thanks so much. Uh, it's not on. It's not on. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Here we go. Perfect. All right. Thanks so much, Susie. Um, kia ora koutou. Yeah, my name's Sean Wilkinson, um, and I run an environmental eDNA or eDNA laboratory called Wilder Lab in Wellington. Um, and we work mainly in the freshwater space, predominantly for the purposes of biodiversity, biosecurity, and monitoring and surveillance. And we've been operating for around four years, during which time we've seen a huge increase in demand um, as more and more organizations adopt eDNA monitoring for environmental management. So a quick intro to eDNA for, for those unfamiliar. Um, eDNA generally refers to cellular material that is constantly being shared into the environment by its inhabitants. Um, and it's generally comprised of things like fecal matter or skin scales, mucus decomposing tissue for dead and dying organisms, um, gametes and larvae, um, which can spike at various times of year, and it can refer to whole organisms as well, um, all collectively um, contributing to that pool of DNA, uh, making it uh, the rivers and lakes and things a bit of a genetic juice. And we can, we can filter out that DNA um, and purify and decode it using a laboratory workflow that involves a, a DNA extraction step. So we purify the DNA, get rid of all the, all the other, other stuff that's in there. And we're going to photocopy it up billions of times using this um, the, the instrument in the middle, which is called a PCR machine. Um, and we create enough copies that we can feed it into the one on the right, which is a, a high throughput DNA sequencer, um, which can produce lots and lots of A's and C's and T's and G's. Um, which, which are in these kind of strings um, or, in, or in sequential order sequences. Um, and we can use these DNA strings to find out which creatures are living nearby uh, by matching these kind of genetic fingerprints, if you like, uh, against the database of sequences that have been extracted from known organisms. So when people work on, say, species, a species of fly or a species of mammal, um, they'll generally do a DNA sequence on it and deposit it into a public reference database. So we use that public database to match these environmental sequences against to figure out which organisms are, are living nearby. Yeah. And it's a, it's a bit like taking a bunch of fingerprints from a crime scene and running them against a big database um, to identify um, the suspects at the crime scene. Um, pretty, pretty, um, pretty similar sort of process that goes on. And this can have huge advantages over traditional monitoring methods. Um, it can be much more sensitive, meaning that the likelihood of detecting your target organism can be can be much increased over, over visual or traditional survey methods. And it enables us to greatly expand the scope of our monitoring as well. So we can be surveying across the tree of life rather than just focusing on one or two groups of, of fish or insects. And it can really give us a more holistic view of how the whole ecosystem is, is functioning. We can get, often get things right down to species level without the help of skilled taxonomists who will argue thick and thin whether this species of stonefly has six gills or eight gills or, or whatnot, um, with, a, with a reasonably low degree of ambiguity um, a lot of the time. And a great thing about it as well is that it can be applied very consistently. So it doesn't matter who's taking the sample, as long as they're following the instructions clearly, um, you can expect to get the same results as, as anybody else. A really awesome thing about eDNA monitoring as well is that it's, it's it's um, kind of future proof, uh, both in terms of um, that we can update old data sets, old eDNA data sets in light of new reference information or new reference sequences, as well as we can pull old eDNA samples out of the freezer and rerun them with new assays that might target new groups of organisms of interest, um, which we can't do with traditional monitoring techniques. Um, but, but like any uh, method, it does have its limitations. Um, it's there's no guarantee that you're going to pick up your target organism, just a bit like fishing. Um, you know, the DNA can just not end up on your filter, just as a, a fish doesn't end up in a net. Um, it certainly doesn't when I go fishing. And of course, we can't identify things that we don't have reference sequences for us to match against. So big holes in the reference database means that a lot of those sequences go 
um, go unidentified or just come up as being unknown organisms, which is kind of frustrating because it's it's beautiful looking data, but it's um, we just don't know what what species a lot of these sequences belong to. Um, <clears throat> and another another issue that eDNA has um, that traditional sort of monitoring doesn't have is this um, this false positive. Um, problem. So this can come about through things like contamination. So if people are careless with their gear and, and um, take their bucket from a, um, a lake that they've, they've sampled recently and, and put it in a new one, then they can uh, introduce DNA that can be uh, sequenced and end up looking like there's a there's an organism there that's not. Um, but a really difficult problem. So the contamination one is is reasonably easy to get around. You know, you, you follow best practice and you take care with your with your gear and everything. A really really difficult problem, which is which is a lot harder to solve, is when things get misidentified, and this tends to happen when species are missing from a reference database, and an environmental sequence um, ends up getting matched to the wrong species. And so this is a bit like using going back to that crime scene analogy. If fingerprint in our crime scene provides a pretty good match to a suspect who's in the police database, um, who then gets falsely accused, while a real culprit whose similar fingerprint isn't in the database gets away scot free. So it's kind of like that. Um, except in, with, with the eDNA, quite often you can have kind of identical fingerprints between different species, so it's a, um, it's a little bit harder to, to manage. Um, so it's a, again, it's, it's a, a, bit of a bit of an issue, but it's, a, again, not a, an impossible fix. All we really need to do is fill our reference database, so make sure we've got everybody in the, in the database, and that way we shouldn't have any issues. And ideally, this would happen as quickly as humanly possible. Um, so there's a couple of examples why having a good reference database is so important and so urgent. Um, and this one is centered in the Cadrona Valley near the famous ski field, um, where a critically endangered population of non-migratory fish called the Clutha flathead, the Laxus, um, have been reduced to just a few remnant hectares of habitat by predation from trout. Uh, these fish are small and camouflaged and very difficult to spot. And so surveying using traditional methods um, is, is kind of leads to a whole bunch of wasted time and effort and money it can be kind of an infeasible way of doing it. There's thousands of kilometres of these little waterways up in high country of Otago that, um, that need to be monitored. And so this is uh, Dr. Chris Kavazos from the DOC, uh, Department of Conservation, the our team, um, who developed a new ETA monitoring program for these Clutha flatheads and has since discovered four new populations which were never known to exist before. Um, using these eDNA techniques. And so Chris and the team have now um, done some really cool um, conservation actions and then re re removed the trout um, and installed these new trout barriers downstream of the occupied reaches. Um, and since the installations have taken place, the, uh, the flatheads have moved right down as far as the barriers and the upper reaches are stacked full of juveniles. Um, so it's a, it's a really nice win for this critically endangered species. So this is the same, same threat ranking as a kakapo critically endangered um, and these guys are out there kind of saving them so which, which is really nice and so you can google Clutha flathead eDNA um, to see some really nice media articles about this um, this particular story. Second example um, comes from the Mangatarata stream in Southern Hawks Bay where a team of regional council ecologists uh, were taking eDNA samples for fish monitoring when the results unexpectedly threw up a signal from what has been dubbed the world's worst weed um, which is, I'm going to struggle with the pronunciation, Alternathura phylloxeroides, or alligator weed. Uh, so this is a South American plant. It's extremely fast growing, very invasive, choked waterways, and it's toxic to animals. Uh, arrived in New Zealand in the 1900s and spread pretty quickly through um, the Waikato, um, Auckland, Northland regions. Recently discovered in the Manawa II um, and had been successfully kept out of the Hawke's Bay, or so we thought, um, until we received this DNA hit, the eDNA hit. Um, so the council launched an incursion response and discovered a pond full of this alligator weed um, just upstream from the sampling site. And thankfully, because they caught it early, um, it looks like we'll be able to be eradicated locally. Um, but if left much longer, it could have easily spread out of control and got right into other waterways um, and become a, a, an impossible problem. So what both of these stories have in common is when we started out, we didn't have a reference sequence for either Clutha flatheads or alligator weed. And through begging and borrowing and stealing, uh, we were able to obtain specimens, uh, which we ran through the DNA sequencer to get those genetic fingerprints. And from then on, we were able to detect them in the, in the eDNA monitoring and, uh, and match them against those reference sequences. So in the time to, it took us to do that, um, you know, how many, who knows how many tiny creatures 
maybe went extinct in that time or new invaders established footholds across the country among the multitudes of species for, for which we still do not have any genetic information, which is the majority of species. Um, so central to addressing some of these big biodiversity problems is through a big shared concerted national effort um, to database these genetic fingerprints of the species we're charged with looking after. Um, thanks. Next to Daisy. Um, thanks very much, Sean. That was a um, yeah, beautiful presentation. I think you know two really wonderful examples of, of the benefits of reference databases and how eDNA can be you know used to aid in conservation and biosecurity. So yeah, thanks, Sean. And just a reminder that if, if you do have questions for Sean, just if you can put them in the chat or write them on your note, notepad and we'll, we'll come back to that at the end of the discussion. So you're yeah, really um, privileged to introduce our second speaker, who is um, Dr. Julia Allwood from uh, Manu. Um, Hanaka Whenua, um, and yeah, we're going to be talking about reference databases for um, animal and environmental applications. Okay, how about this? Perfect. <laughs> okay, well, good morning, everyone. Atamarie, um, ko Julia o Tako Ingoa, um, ke Manaki Whenua, Aho e Mahiana. Um, so I'm going to, I don't have any specific projects to talk to you um, about today, but what I wanted to talk about during our time was reference databases from an end point um, user point of view and what you might sort of be looking for in a reference database for your work. So um, forgive me for those of you that this is what you do every day, but just to kind of give us a bit of an introduction. When you're working with DNA and you're in the sort of, you're looking for a reference database, the database you are going to be looking for depends a bit on what you're testing and the, the answers you're trying to get out. So a few things you might be looking for when you're testing samples is what is it? So you want to um, identify the species, like Sean was saying, through DNA barcoding or some other means. Uh, you might want to know, is it present? So this is just basic presence absence testing. So is there, um, is, the, is the species you're interested in within the sample you're collecting? You might want to know whose is it? So that would be individualization. So you might know um, the species, but you might want to know, if, if, was it you know, in this individual or another one? You might also want to know where is it from. So this is sometimes referred to as provenance. So that would be if you took an anonymous sample, you might want to predict it back to um, its original location, or you might want to um, estimate a population of origin for a specific animal, for instance. So if we break this down a little bit further, so if you're looking at what it is, you've got your species identification and you want to know, you know, in this example, is it a dog or a giraffe? For your presence absence testing, you're doing the similar kind of work, but you want to know is the species um, present or absent. And the kind of reference databases you might want for this are um, DNA sequence based databases, but you need to have, they need to be comparable. You need to be a, know that you're comparing like with like. So you need to know that the species you're potentially detecting are present in that database, otherwise you might miss them. And you need to know that the reference database you've got is holding information that's compatible with the method you're using so you can actually compare it. So whose is it? You might do DNA genotyping for this and this is when you want to know one individual to another. So you, your database in this context would be um, a snapshot of different DNA profiles for that species. So you knew sort of what you were looking at in an individual level. Or you might want to look at where is it from. So this is the provenance one. And in this example, you might again do DNA genotyping because you might want to predict back an individual sample to a population of origin. Um, and this can have uses in um, eradication programs and conservation management, things like that. And in this case, again, you'd want um, your reference database would be DNA profiles representative of the different populations that you're, that you're looking at. So in terms of priorities, and this is not an exhausted list, this is just what I was thinking about when I was um, looking at this question. This is also assuming that, of course, you have correct permissions and access to any database that you're using. So assuming you've got access, what you might want to look for is it's got to be an appropriate context, so it's got to be fit for purpose. And this is what I was saying before, you need your reference database to be able to allow you to compare like to like. 
Um, so for species identification, you would want your reference database to house lots of DNA sequences of the same kind of gene that you might be targeting. Ideally, you want your database to be robust and reliable. And so this is both in terms of generation, um, in terms of um, minimal, you know, no com um, contamination and really valid identification. So ideally, this is from vouchered specimens or digitized uh, museum collections. And of particular importance, if you're doing providence or population of origin, you really want comprehensive metadata with those samples so you can be confident of um, source, um, origin source. You want it to be comprehensive. Um, so Sean mentioned this earlier, you, you sort of want to, you need to know what you're looking for to retrospectively know it's in the, have it in the database. So you can run into false negatives where you would be comparing something against the database and you don't get a good match because that species isn't actually represented. Um, it's also really good to have really closely related species in there as well. So you get that real fine resolution and can be confident in your um, identification result. And it's the same with um, populations. You want as many populations uh, included there that you are going to be comparing against and that each population is adequately represented. Another thing that I think is quite interesting to know is sort of the known variables or the known limits of your database, you know, is there gaps in the species representation, for instance, is there something like temporal variation, which might not be important for lots of studies, but, but may be relevant. So sort of know where your gaps are and, and the parameters of what you can work in with that database. Nice to haves might also include um, curated or version control. Um, as Sean said, you can add to samples um, as the technology goes along and as you sort of generate more information, but you might want to um, be able to put a timestamp on the database in the form that you used it in. And if it's, you know, user friendly as well, that's, that's an added bonus. So say then that you've got your reference database that's you, that you've deemed as fit for purpose. So you've, you've checked all the specifics, you know it's appropriate for use, you've got the right kind of targets to compare to your own data. Um, the method is compatible, you can access it easily and format it into your workflows. You might need to look at things like um, scale uh, and workarounds there. So you may be looking at specific genes, but perhaps you can um, explore whole genome data to see if you can use genes of interest from that. And conversely, perhaps you are doing a next generation sequencing or a really high throughput approach, but you might be able to curate your own reference data based, um, based on high quality um, Sanger DNA, DNA sequence data. So the advantages with obviously that's available is a more detailed sort of informed outcome. So it's quite commonly said that, you know, the, the data you put in is only as good as the data you're comparing it to and the data that, that will guide the data quality that you get out or your, your result that you get out. So if you have a really uh, robust and reliably generated reference database, I think any time you use that, uh, you have a greater confidence in the outcomes. You also don't have the added expense um, to generate that kind of reference information within, within your own project. Disadvantages when they're not available, of course, is potentially positive information. So you might not have comprehensive coverage of all of the, all of the different species or individuals that you want to work with. And then you might need to caveat your outcomes based on that because, um, because of some of those gaps and limitations. And of course, the massive one is the added resources. Uh, involved so it's time and funds and I think for a lot of projects um, generating a reference database that's comprehensive is sort of practically impossible for, um, for some, some work. So now I just wanted to give a few examples of um, more sort of international databases that are available to give us sort of an idea of what what's out there. So there's the Earth Microbiome Project, which is um, the meta barcoding approach that um, similar to what Sean was describing. And so these are end user um, uploaded data sets following set methods. And then the consortium does sort of uh, meta analyses across all of that. So it's sort of characterizing microbial life and anyone can access that data and do their own analyses. There is a um, initiative called Foresight, which is 
focused on sequencing the entire mitochondrial genomes from vouchered reference material. And this is for particularly trafficked animals because there's often a limitation in accessing positive control material or that reference sequence material. And you want that good quality reference data to make a good match. There's the Vertebrate Genomes Project, which is doing whole genome sequencing um, per species. And then my last point there is um, probably more to do with DNA genotyping, but there is a lot of work um, and a lot of databases and a lot of labs where people might be working on a species you're interested in, but it's just held within a lab. So it might not be um, accessible or it might be non-transferable, which is some of the issues with some of the DNA, um, DNA genotyping methods. They're not easily transferred lab to lab. So now I just wanted to give you a few examples of databases in action. And so this is, these are all published, published um, studies. So the first one is looking at um, a large ivory seizure. So this is, sorry, elephant ivory. And so they did um, DNA profiles on um, a subset of the seized items. And because they had really good reference database of similar DNA profiles from countries in Africa for both elephant species, they were able to, from the profiles alone, um, identify the actual species it was, which in of itself removed lots of potential countries of origin within Africa because they don't have that species. And then they were able to narrow it down even further to a a likely few subset of small countries and minimize the amount of potential trafficking trade routes that needed to be investigated. So that really allowed some targeting of investment of wildlife management resources. Another one closer to home, um, some of our colleagues and others was looking at a single stoat in, um, present on a predator free island that had had a recent eradication program be completed. And they wanted to know if it was an eradication survivor or a reinvader. And it was quite an instance of um, long distance dispersal potentially. So this was really important. So they used a database of samples pre-eradication from that same island and database of samples from the mainland. And the outcome was determined that it was a reinvader from the mainland. So that long distance dispersal had occurred and that there was need for ongoing biosecurity efforts um, and the importance of having these comparison data sets. Two examples now of not necessarily difficulties, but where it is really important to know the limits and characteristics of your database when you employ them. So again, this is some of our colleagues and a few others did this work looking at um, meta barcoding from um, soil samples and they investigated key elements in the, in the lab methods and the impacts of those aspects on the final data and they found that the DNA extraction method and um, things like the number of PCR replicates did have an impact of the species that was detected the other end. Um, so it's important to know that your reference database you're using, if you were using one in this case, is as, as like for like as, as possible to allow a, a really accurate comparison. Another one it was looking at identifying pollen species from, um, from bees in the States. And so they wanted to get an idea of foraging behavior so they could further enrich the climate to support um, pollinator survival. They looked at um, meta barcoding to ID the pollen species compared to the classical morphological identification of pollen. And they, um, the outcome was that they, detected more species with the meta barcoding, but that it worked best in combination with their morphological approach. And interestingly, they used um, a publicly available um, repository, um, Gene Bank on Blast, which I'm sure a lot of you have used. And they found that a lot of their identifications through the meta barcoding method were plants that weren't in that area and weren't really possible. So they were probably false positives. It also pointed out the gaps in that reference database used because there was thousands of local plant species that weren't represented in GeneBank. So that one's just an example of um, sort of knowing, knowing what you're looking for a little bit and knowing the limitations of your reference database. Uh, and I think that's probably enough from me. Um, thanks everyone. Got to thank, thanks very much, um, Julia. And yeah, I think it's really another, some more, uh, 
really interesting examples and I'm always amazed by the, um, the diversity of how these different techniques will be used in the different types of organisms. So re some really great examples there and the, the benefits of reference databases. So we'll move on. Um, and there's some great questions coming up in the chat and keep those definitely keep those coming and we'll, we will come back to them. Um, our third speaker is Dr. Anastasia Zyko from the, the Coursera Institute. Um, so yeah, really excited to welcome Anastasia. And yeah, Anastasia leads a large uh, marine biosecurity project, which has a, um, a large molecular component. So yeah, looking forward to your talk, Anastasia. Thank you, Susie. Can you hear me okay? We can, we can hear you. Um, you've got a blank screen. Yep. Here we go. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I will try to share my screen now. Hopefully it works. Can you see it? Can you see it? Yep. Yep, you're not on display mode there, but if you can. And yep. now, can you see uh, it as a display mode? No, nope, you just need to go to the top to the display setting there and, and switch your screen. Um, um, coming over to the left and where it says display setting. Okay. Just need to switch your screens. Next one over, that one there, if you click on the little arrow there. Oh, next one. Um, this one? The one over to the to the right, sorry. This one, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, that oh, should make it Thank work. you, thank you, Susan. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so kia ora. My name is Anastasia Zaiko. I'm a biosecurity, marine biosecurity scientist, a scientist at uh, Cosran Institute, Nelson. And today I'm going to present, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, uh, workshop. I think it's really important to talk about databases because it's like a, a big bottleneck in um, harnessing the power of all those awesome molecular tools that we have in our hands now. And I'm going to present uh, a case, uh, user case study, uh, how um, metaverse coding uh, data sets that are being generating across the board can help to improve and upscale marine biosecurity and also how important the um, reference databases uh, are to, to achieve this goal. Uh, so molecular tools uh, and specifically eDNA are increasingly used in environmental research and uh, they help to improve our understanding about uh, biodiversity, species distribution, ecosystem health and functioning. And also obviously they have multiple applications uh, for marine biosecurity, the field that is dedicated to protecting marine ecosystems from the spread of unwanted organisms. Uh, like using eDNA approach, uh, we can actually help detecting those um, like molecular fingerprints that uh, Sean presented that beautifully uh, from uh, organisms that have just arrived to our uh, marine environments and have not spread and made any harm. And um, uh, this way we can protect our vulnerable um, environments and also monitor better the hotspot areas like ports and marinas and prevent uh, the distribution and spread of those unwanted organisms. Uh, but of course, molecular tools are used not only in biosecurity uh, context, but uh, are used across the board for different purposes, for ecosystem monitoring, for community projects, uh, like educational projects, for academical research on biodiversity and so on. And as a result, uh, we have accum like accumulated already and keep accumulating a huge amount of um, very valuable molecular data sets from different regions across New Zealand and uh, from different realms. Uh, for example, here you can see a snapshot of uh, like different papers that have been published over the last 20 years uh, on eDNA studies, actually eDNA and eRNA, and only from aquatic uh, realms, from uh, marine or freshwater um, ecosystems. And you can see that there are like hundreds and thousands of papers, and uh, the number is growing exponentially. And uh, most of these data, they also may contain important and useful information on potential pests. And this information is currently not effectively used because we do not have access to uh, like this uh, information or these uh, species just uh, remain invisible in those like huge data sets. So imagine if we could use a tool or uh, an app that could harness the, this useful information that is currently hidden in this data. 
and uh, um, easily use this app to easily screen for species of biosecurity concern. Also do some additionally, additional quality uh, assurance of this data and then report <coughs> the uh, detections uh, to the decision makers and managers. And if we could accumulate this information across time and space, how useful it might be. So with these questions in, uh, in our heads, we decided to actually develop such a tool as part of the Marine Biosecurity Toolbox program. So we created the Pest Alert tool that is currently available online um, for screening 18S and CO1 datasets. And these are the most commonly used metabarcoding markers uh, in eDNA research for marine indigenous species uh, detection and as well as uh, flagging uh, the presence of unwanted and notifiable marine organisms in New Zealand. So how the tool works, you just like a user can submit the sequence file into the app and it will screen it uh, against a like, customized and curated uh, reference database uh, that was compiled based on the uh, NIS reference uh, list uh, from uh, New Zealand uh, marine uh, invasive taxonomic service uh, of MPI and also the marine non-indigenous species data set by the Ministry uh, for the Environment. And um, uh, it returns the list of species that are listed as non-indigenous and also highlights uh, the organisms that uh, are listed as unwanted and notifiable marine organisms. As you see on this example, it is highlighted in red for Sabella splanzani. Uh, further, a user can also explore a little bit more how good is the match. Uh, look at the uh, original reference sequence, where it comes from, how trustworthy it is, and also generate automatically generate phylogenetic tree and look uh, whether the query sequence clusters well and exclusively with the listed NIS species. Like in this example, you can see this highlighted uh, sequence here. For Sabella Splanzani, and you see that it uh, clusters really well with the other reference Sabella Splanzani and uh, Sabella species. So we can be pretty sure that this, this is the true match. So the screening tool is already available online and being used by researchers and also for educational community projects. However, we decided to take it one step further and also allow users to register their findings in the extension app called Expat, uh, which saves the results from the Pestella tool and saves them as a, a georeferenced uh, data set uh, with some additional information, like for example, the time of the sample collection, what type of sample uh, this information comes from and any other additional notes that user uh, would like to provide, for example, on the uh, provenance of the sample, the, any limitations of the data use, uh, the project that comes from and so on. And uh, with the accumulation of such data, we see that this tool uh, could allow to, to collect a very useful data set that can be then filtered uh, by region, by time, by species, uh, by species status and verification level, and uh, be used as an early warning system for unwanted uh, uh, species detections uh, to help understand species spread and distribution patterns inform better management efforts, uh, track management success, and also it can be extended further to other species of interest like uh, aquaculture pathogens, uh, harmful algal bloom species, other mercury genes or other environments. So there is great potential that we see in this tool, but such tool is only as good as the underpinning reference database, of course. And if we do not have sequences for species of interest, and ideally also for their closely related species to allow the verification of the sequence match and minimize the risk of these uh, false detections and uh, misidentifications, it won't get flagged in the submitted data set. And in our compiled list of marine NIS, actually, we have only half of the species that have reliable references in the openly available databases. And moreover, uh, some of the notifiable and unwanted species do not have any good reference either. So it is clear that augmenting database is very important and a non-trivial task. And uh, it is not 
not surprising that researchers constantly and consistently emphasize that uh, there is a need of collaborative, coordinated and international efforts uh, in that space to uh, create those databases, curate them better and uh, augment and develop them further. And just imagine that if we could have uh, such a complete database for New Zealand and marine biodiversity, not only for invasive species, but for native species as well, which is appropriately governed and uh, assembled and curated with respect to Manafeno and Wakapapa, we could then allow uh, any metabarcoding data holder to screen their data sets and report the results in such kind of a traffic light registry that would show if a sample or location contains only native species and with like a good biosecurity status, uh, if there are uh, some known to New Zealand uh, non-indigenous species detected, or if there are any species of concern or species uh, that have not be been previously known in New Zealand that should be um, uh, reported to MPI and uh, uh, managed. And uh, we see that this would allow upscaling our best security watch system nationwide and also improve the protection of our valuable marine resources. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And also I would like to acknowledge my colleagues uh, who worked with me on this project and helped to create these uh, tools and these uh, applications. And I'll be happy to take any questions later. Thanks, Anastasia. Um, yeah, another wonderful talk and yeah, uh, really interesting to see the, your, your data there on the, the completeness of databases and see that you know we're only 50% of the way there for some of those really um, invasive species. Um, and yeah, really nice to see a tool developed that's allowing um, end users, stakeholders, iwi to input data um, and actually see data produced in an understandable way. So yeah, really neat. And I'm sure come, there'll be some questions for you later on. Um, so our, our fourth speaker for today is Dr. Shane Sturrock from um, ESR, and is going to be telling us about some of his work on um, potential CITES material coming into, into Aotearoa. Um, Shane, you're, uh, hopefully you're there somewhere in the... I'm here, yes. Here we are. Perfect. Thanks, Shane. Um, unfortunately, no slides, because I'm literally back from holiday, uh, so I'm, I'm kind of winging it. Um, yeah, so so basically, uh, ESR, we, we, we do a lot of forensics work, and we've been seeing a, an increasing amount of biological material coming in through the border due to online ordering uh, becoming popular during lockdown and, and since then. Um, that material is often in very poor condition, so it's been heavily processed, it's been powdered, you're looking at things like Chinese medicines, that sort of stuff. Uh, you might get carved material or it's been through a process of preservation, which can be very destructive to the DNA. Um, but DNA extraction is still possible. And identification of the species uh, can be complicated by the, the lack of good reference data, just as we've been talking about. Of course, this stuff is, is not New Zealand native, um, but I think it's relevant uh, to the discussion because, of course, New Zealand has a, a number of native species that are highly endangered. So the the purpose of, of this analysis that we've been doing was the possibility that material was was um, CITES listed. So CITES is the uh, the Convention on the International Trade in an Endangered Species, uh, which is one of the largest and oldest conservation and sustainable use agreements in, in existence, uh, originally set up around uh, 1975. So there's about 38,000 species and subspecies which are currently protected. Um, New Zealand, we, we have uh, a reasonable number of these, actually. Uh, I was just having a look at the database and um, CITES listed species that are in New Zealand um, number around about 500. Uh, of CITES 1, which are the most endangered, there's, there's um, about 24, I think it was. Uh, but obviously the material we were seeing was was not originating in New Zealand. Um, in this particular case, we were, as we're coming from a forensic background, we're, we're wanting to have court admissible results because the material was obviously uh, questionable. Um, and so the material also needed to be non-destructively sampled. Uh, in this case, it was a carving. Um, and so we went through the process of sampling and we used published PCR primers uh, for a cytochrome B from mitochondrial genome. And the region that these 
primus came from. Uh, it shouldn't surprise anybody that this was a piece of ivory. And it was said to be mammoth, um, but of course it could possibly have been uh, from, from currently uh, endangered species of elephants. And so that was what we needed to test for, was, was, was this DNA from uh, mammoth or elephant? And so there's a region of the cytochrome B um, which is only about 150 bases long or so, where there are, I think, four variants, which will let you see whether it's an elephant or a mammoth. Uh, so this, this requires quite a strict level of uh, identification. Now, the approach that I take is one of, uh, we want a yes or no answer. Uh, we don't want to be getting, you know, wishy-washy, oh, it could possibly be type of answers. So for that reason, we couldn't use something like BLAST. Also, BLAST is extremely slow for this kind of work. You're dealing with NGS data, you've got millions of reads, and unless you want to go through a process of de novo assembly um, to reduce the data down, uh, reference mapping is, is designed for this kind of data. And so what I did was I created a pseudo-reference genome where I took a number of sequences uh, of cytochrome B from, from a variety of mammalian species, including humans, in case we had any uh, human contamination. And, um, and I included the elephant and mammoth sequences in there as well. And then I used a very high stringency mapping approach using Bowtie 2 in this case, and I mapped the reads. And it was something I could do extremely rapidly, it took a matter of seconds, and we immediately got the answer back that this was mammoth sequence. Now, the processing, of course, of, of the, um, the sequence before mapping, you have to do things like primer trimming and adapter trimming and such. But once, once you do that, you map the, the reads uh, very strictly, and it gives you a really nice yes, no answer. Uh, of course, as, as has been said by other speakers today, if you don't have the reference sequence in there, then the reads won't map. Uh, but that was kind of the point as well, is that if we didn't have a mammoth, um, we wouldn't get a, it could possibly be something else, a cat or whatever, it's it's going to map against the thing it is. Um, and in fact, as I say, the, the sequences were extremely accurate. Uh, a lot of the work that's been done on things like ancient DNA, for instance, is of, of great value uh, in dealing with this. Now, the, the issues with data have been mentioned as well. Um, and I did go to a conference over in uh, the US back in October, um, or, again, it was, this was all around CITES and endangered species. Um, and one of the things that did come out of that was it's a global problem, is that the, there is a lot of siloing of, of data. So you might see things like uh, the barcode of life, for instance, where, yes, you can search your sequences against that, but you can't get access to the, the raw database. Uh, so if you wanted to use a method like mine, you can't get the sequence. Um, and there's a lot of other species which are CITES protected, which again, they're, they're not publishing that, that, um, that data, so you can't use it. So you're reliant on the publicly available databases. And, and in fact, I used sequences that we derived from NCBI GenBank. Um, other issues, of course, is that uh, there's also the, the, the dubious provenance of the data that you get from the public databases. So while we were lucky in the case of ivory that uh, mammoth genome is uh, mitochondrial genome is published and, and well known uh, if we were dealing with something else and we had a, a another sample come in that was planted in this case we used ITS2 sequences uh, and in that case that was a bit more tricky because the publicly available database is a little bit more iffy um, so so the the provenance of data is important in these databases especially if you want it to stand up in court and so what I would say to this group, of course, is if we're if we're sequencing um, native New Zealand species, we need to make it available. So, of course, there's questions about ownership of it, but it, it's all well and good to make a database. But if it's not available to somebody who who is receiving material uh, at their border in Indonesia or China or in Europe, for instance, uh, they're not going to be able to identify it. So, yes, if we build a database, uh, that's great, but we do need to make it available. And that's about me. Um, kia ora, thank, thanks um, Shane for that, especially um, so soon after you've returned for holiday. Yes, yeah, so I think some really interesting points um, came up from there and I'm sure there'll be a number of um, questions coming up the, around the sort of provenance of data and how whether we 
how we make and whether we make databases publicly available. And I'm always amazed what we can, you know, what we can extract DNA from. So um, yeah, thanks for those um, good provoking um, presentation. So our, our um, next speaker is um, Michael um, Pingham from Waikato Regional Council. And it's gonna be telling us about an EnviroLink um, project underway to, I think, actually develop um, some reference databases for Aotearoa. So um, yeah, welcome, Michael. Uh, kia ora. Um, thanks for that introduction. I'll just uh, get this going. Are you seeing that, Susie? Uh, we can't actually, you're, you're still a black uh -huh. screen at the moment, sorry. In fact, that's looking good. We've got your desk, desktop. There we go. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, cool. No, an extra button I missed. Um, yeah, well, thank you for having me along today. Um, yeah. Oh, I've got a good echo. Um, so hopefully this works. Um, our internet connection is a little bit unstable here. Um, yeah, kia ora. I'm, I'm Michael Pingram. Um, been asked today to give a, a quick run through of a um, MBIE EnviroLink Tools project that has been funded through. Um, the Environment Tools program and, and that program sets out to sort of fund um, across regional councils and unitary authorities um, essentially tool development that involves um, hopefully has a good implement, implementation pathway and also um, involves the development of um, better environmental outcomes and, and the things that we can do to achieve that. Um, so it's quite a large team as you can see. Um, I'm reasonably new to this so this is um, it's going to be me winging it a little bit, um, having taken over from Bruno David, who's um, left the regional sector. Um, and I'll have to confess, I don't know a huge amount about eDNA, so all the questions can uh, go to Sean, who's also here today. Um, so I guess from a, um, I guess a regional council perspective, um, why, why is developing a uh, reference library collection really important? Well, we've got an increasing number of, um, I guess, demands on the environmental monitoring that we're responsible for and what people want to see. And this, um, I guess, is an increasing number of state of the environment type questions. Um, we've got an um, increasing policy um, emphasis on threatened species, and we've also got longstanding requirements in biosecurity. Um, I guess one of the challenges we face, and um, particularly with some of the ecological monitoring, um, is that existing methods can be pretty time consuming and costly. Um, if you're thinking about electric fishing of a stream reach, for example, um, looking at the native fish communities, it can involve quite large teams of up to four people. And if we're also wanting to incorporate um, other parts of the ecology or ecosystem health at those sites, um, it can require multiple visits by different teams and different types of samples to quantify different assemblages. So it can start to become quite an extensive exercise in pulling together different data sets collected in different ways. So I guess the opportunity presented by eDNA and, and also um, having a reference library to support that is that it has uh, um, everybody's favourite potential to reduce costs for routine monitoring. Um, and I guess this relates into things like sample processing, travel and staff time, um, potentially freeing us up to, to do more of what we do in terms of um, environmental monitoring, but also getting involved in the rehabilitation um, of things such as fish passage barriers like culverts and stuff and actually assessing or going through prioritization exercises and then identifying where things work and where they don't. It also gives us an opportunity to start to look into detecting sensitive um, rare or low abundant species and I guess thinking about the Waikato region, um, things like uh, black mudfish which um, uh, estivate or hibernate for part of the year so it can be very difficult to detect in some systems, um, particularly when um, it's not obvious that there might be fish, fish values present. Um, and uh, I guess it then leads us into the opportunity to develop potentially more um, informative metrics or indices or ways of describing ecosystems that we might be able to feed into um, some of the other policy requirements that we have coming our way around developing action plans and actually getting getting in and making some environmental improvements with our communities and, and some of our established indicators such as the macroinvertebrate community index for example may not actually be sensitive enough to pick up at the early signs of change or degradation so having this ability to get in and develop new tools um, to detect improvements in particular is really valuable and it also um, gives us the ability to potentially develop new communication tools 
Um, but obviously for all of this to really work um, and for the sampling effort to, to be worthwhile, we need a really fit for purpose reference library. Um, I guess in terms of the tools such as, uh, it's only as good as, as good as what we can relate um, the data sets back to and, and being able to detect species um, as obviously relies as everyone else has sort of covered this morning on having that reference library in place. And I guess um, we need to be able to access it um, as well, I guess, and obviously accessing the right parts and in the right ways to, to, meet, to meet our requirements. Um, so I guess the objectives of the process was essentially to generate um, a large number of DNA sequences, um, focusing on protected marine fish, fishes and their co-occurring congeners, um, generate DNA sequences um, for priority marine fishes found in estuarine and coastal habitats, and then um, I guess getting into the freshwater space, generating DNA sequences for freshwater and insect taxa, primarily those used in the macroinvertebrate community index calculations. So this is a sort of predefined list of around 150 taxa. Um, I guess the, one of the challenges faced by some of the, the, that, that particular metric, the MCI, is that it tends to focus on um, sort of genera or higher level taxonomy. So it doesn't um, allow us to pick up thresh, threatened freshwater ta insect taxa, for example, which are often identified down to species level. Um, so I guess wrapped up in all this is around 850 um, DNA sequences of fish and freshwater invertebrate samples is proposed to be analysed. Um, I guess um, primarily um, the goal is to use existing vouchered specimens and collections, um, but obviously for a number of the, um, the specimens that need to be sequenced, we're going to need to go out and potentially um, collect some of those. So working closely with um, expert taxonomists and getting those deposited in national collections. Um, this sort of sampling effort um, is, is working closely with other councils across the country, Department of Conservation, Mana Whenua groups, um, and also with museums. Um, and then once these have sort of been um, collected and vouchered, um, getting onto the DNA sequencing for the, the relevant parts of the genome that, that are useful for the tool and then ultimately into a reference library and made available for, for use appropriately. Um, so just to guess a quick um, update on the progress, that's pretty good progress so far, and the program is still <clears throat> in the early parts of its existence. Um, so there's been quite a bit of progress made collecting um, and vouchering and sequencing across the target orders, organism groups, um, with around 50% of estuarine and coastal um, fish species um, either being sequenced, um, sourced from other collections or databases, um, and then around another 25%, uh, and then also um, with specimens already collected. Um, I guess in the invertebrate freshwater and insect space, um, for macroinvertebrate taxa relevant to the MCI calculations, um, it's also around about 50% progress there, um, but still a bit of work to do, partic particularly with the threatened species um, sampling as well. Um, so I guess looking to the future, some of these examples have already been um, presented, um, but I guess, you know, expanding the, the, the library into um, the necessary parts of, or into more parts of uh, ecological assemblages, um, the scope of the eDNA tool and monitoring to support the management of a wider range of biodiversity than what we currently investigate is um, enhanced. And I guess the more known sequences we, we have, then the more possible answers and information we can derive from samples. It starts to allow us to sort of um, move into sort of more targeted species work, whether that's in a biosecurity or a biodiversity space, um, as well as developing sort of whole ecosystem type metrics. Um, it also gives us the opportunity to potentially pick up terrestrial and aquatic um, life forms um, side by side from the same sampling events. And I guess looking into how some of our stream systems work um, and how the, the riparian links with the aquatic part of that as well. Um, and quite importantly, um, improving the knowledge um, of I guess rare or uh, believed to be rare species um, for conservation um, purposes is also really important. And there's been a few examples um, come up recently where um, the believed range of certain um, species may be greater than previously thought. Um, so I guess um, coming up, um, there's a, a another um, seminar being run by the people in the project who actually know what they're talking about, um, which is Amy and Libby. And um, so there's a link there, which I will um, share with Manpreet to maybe pass around afterwards as well. So it'd be great if you want to hear more about um, that EnviroLink Tools project to, to get really stuck into building a reference library. Um, yeah, please feel free to come along to that. That'd be great. Thanks. Um, thanks, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, really neat to get a, a 
an update on that project and see that that progressing so well. And I think I know Michael's got to um, leave pretty quickly, and so um, I'm sure um, Shane is available to answer questions. So fire your questions into that that chat if you've got any for um, for Michael. So our final um, presenter in in this part of the the program is um, Professor Mike Bunce from um, the Department of Conservation. Um, yeah, and he's a he's got a huge experience in the in the field of environmental DNA and ancient DNA. So you're really um, privileged to have Mike speaking to us today. So handing over to you. Thanks, Mike. Kia ora, Susie, and Morena Tato, everyone. Uh, ko nā ka hautu whekarekareka o tamatia pō kai whenua te moanga, ko o pāwhud awa, ko Bunce Frame te whanau, ko Mike Bunce ahau. Um, thanks for that warm introduction, Susie. Um, my name is Mike Bunce. I'm the Chief Science Advisor at Te Papa Atawhai Department of Conservation, a role I've been in since, since November. So I thought I'd spend the 10 minutes I've got today talking a little bit about from databases to decisions, uh, why we need environmental DNA in our toolkit and why we need to take those environmental DNA barcodes and, and map them onto, onto species. So starting off with, um, you know, I'd say, you know, it has to be sort of underlined immediately. No amount of information is valuable if no one's going to use it. This is from the Parliamentary Commissioners from the Environment's October 2022 report. And when we're doing environmental DNA, and this is the problem statements, we generate an in a huge amount of data. So eDNA has the ability to generate epic amounts of data. So shown picture here, we've seen this a couple of times already in these talks, the huge amount of biodiversity data we can come out from using tree of life based meta barcoding approaches. You know, birds, insects, everything down to bacteria. Um, and that's tremendous. We, we, we truly are starting to look at the interconnectedness of, of ecosystems and tap into what Te Ao Māori says is look at the murder, the life force of the system and how it interconnects. So the challenge is, is, is not how that if we can collect the data, it's, it's how we use this information to listen to nature. The importance of keeping score when we're doing that, watching what progress is going on. And, and really importantly, and this is where we've got a bit of work to do, how we make good decisions based on that. You know, Sean gave a good example of the um, of the flathead um, galaxid in there, but making good decisions that help help our Tonga species um, thrive in the environment. So we tend to organise things as as zoologists and biologists a lot. I got given because I'm a bit of a biology nerd. I got given this book by um, by my kids at at Christmas. How zoologists organise things. It's a fascinating read. Um, you know, um, this is a depiction of Noah's Ark and they organized things in pairs and stuck them into a boat. Linnaeus put them into kind of eggs and spheres about where you put organisms. Then we started moving into, into trees and putting things on tips and how things might be interconnected with each other. And at the very tail end of the put, they show a cutting edge DNA sequencing uh, uh, trace saying that we can organize things by genetics as well. Um, so we like to organize things and put them into pigeonholes and call things different names. Um, it's natural for us to want to do that. The first sort of species I spent working on taxonomy was New Zealand's extinct moa. And Kieran Mitchell's online and he's done a lot of work on this as well. If we go into some of the seminal textbooks on this, um, we'll see lots of pictures of bones. And there's actually these keys that, that, that help us identify the bones. And, you know, there's lots of jargon in here. You can look at complex tuberosities on ventral staffs and the trochanters and articulate surfaces. They're looking at, in essence, they're looking at bumps on bones and they're using those characters to identify different species. In the case of moa, they got it a little bit wrong because they call two different species, uh, two different sexes, the male and female, two different species. Um, and it shows how, um, I guess, DNA and, and morphology can work together um, to resolve taxonomic conundrums that, that, that are still um, kick around with us today. But the point I'm trying to make here is that looking at characters on bones or looking at a photograph of your favorite bird, you identify characters that are unique to that individual that makes that identification possible. When we move into DNA barcodes, we're just looking at, at, at A, T, and C characters and how they differ between species or between genera or between families. We're looking at other, we're looking at other characters. And you know, I stress the point um, that, that looking at DNA barcodes, which is typically short bits of mitochondrial DNA, is not genomics. 
Genomics means sequencing the entire genome of an organism. Typically, what we've talked about, most of what we've talked about today, is sequencing a very small piece that can identify one species away from the other. Is it any different from bumps on a bone that identify one bone as one species or another? And, and so that's the challenge out there to think about that. Not all DNA is created equal. DNA barcodes are not genomes. Um, you can't really bioprospect them. Um, they are morphologic. They're no, really different from morphological characters. And so that's, the, that's just trying to get you to think about um, DNA as a, as a spectrum of, of, of tools that are out there. This is an example paper that I just sort of throw out there because it came out yesterday from work when I was uh, um, in a previous life when I was an academic, um, doing a three-year um, study all around Australia from different states, um, different stations all around Australia over three years. Huge amounts of work that went into it. We collected 25 million animal barcodes. Only 50% of those barcodes, those 25 million, we could identify down to a genus or species level. The rest are sitting at family level or higher. Now, what is in, in a perfect world, and as Sean pointed out, um, we would be able to identify we would be able to identify every twenty five million of those animal barcodes down to its species, but we can't currently at the moment. That doesn't mean we can't do useful things with the data at this point in time, and and I do reject the idea that um, we should wait for these databases to be fully populated and stable before we do work in this area because there's an awful lot we can do even with databases we have today but it's only going to get better and that's the key point here is that someone will be able to go back maybe 10 20 years in the future and nail every one of those 25 million barcodes down to an actual species the bottom um sort of that colored graph down the bottom just shows different different locations around australia on the far right you've got darwin and the far left you've got tasmania and it's, and it's just a representation of, of DNA barcodes, different types of communities, but clusters of barcodes, if you like, that are found in some locations and not others. And that's probably unex, um, not unexpected, right? Because things live in warm water and things live in cool water. But it, what it allows us to do, and I won't show that today, is it allows us to show changes through, through time, um, the stability of that system, and indeed whether it's changing or not, as the ocean is potentially warming. So we're developing barometers of, of how ecosystems are changing. To sort of put my doc hat on for a second and, and talk about New Zealand's biodiversity strategy and indeed doc strategy, it's a pretty simple one is that Papa Tuanuku is thriving. Um, if we go down a couple of layers from that, we've got um, strategies around defining, introduce new strategies to measure and monitor, uh, evaluate um, conservation progress and use measures to tell stories around the difference that our work is making for Aotearoa New Zealand. In other words, we need to listen to nature, we need to keep score, we need to tell stories and we need to track outcomes. And it was really sort of interesting and, um, you know, to keep an eye on what's going on in Australia, because this bill is going through Parliament in Australia at the moment. It's called the Nature um, Repair Bill or the Nature Repair Market Bill. And what, what Australia is trying to do is to, is to create a new market that looks at biodiversity values, uh, where landholders can get certificates um, from carbon projects that create biodiversity. That's trying to essentially monetize it. But to do that, and we know this from the emissions trading scheme, we do need to be able to keep score. And that's where things um, get challenging. And so, um, you know, Sean's been spearheading using the Tiki Index, which is like the macroinvertebrate community index that Michael just talked about, but it's using 3000 barcodes from around New Zealand's rivers to try and um, determine uh, whether a river is in good condition, excellent conditions, or poor condition. And it uses 3,000 barcodes that look like really good canaries in the coal mine. But we don't need one of them or even 150. We need thousands of them to accurately detect um, some of the changes uh, that we're seeing in New Zealand's ecosystem. Now, this is not new. Susie's got a similar one for her Lakes 380 project. Xavier pushon has got one for looking at aquaculture impacts. There are things we can do without the taxonomic framework but it would be much better if we could identify every one of those 3,000 barcodes indicator species onto a taxonomic framework. And indeed, talking to Sean, only about 10% of those we can nail down to species or genus level. So there's a lot of indicators in there that we don't know what they are. Doesn't mean we can't use them, 
It just means we don't have all the information that we can use. So using these sort of index and these ticky indexes, um, you know, if we think into the future, what we want to see, well, we want to see changes. Are things getting better as we restore them or are they getting worse because of inputs? Um, it is not out of the realms of possibility that using these approaches, we could um, we could do thousands of rivers and maybe all of the lakes, Susie, around, around New Zealand every year because we can build indexes that can tell us about the health and whether it's improving or, or declining or whether it's stable. So we are able to keep score and, and we can do that using these tools and we can do it better with reference databases because we know that this, what the species are and potentially how they interact together. So what does good look like, um, you know, for biomonitoring? Um, I can say, you know, straight from the thing, it doesn't look like just doing environmental DNA. I can say that for a, for a fact, right? There are lots and lots of tools that we can potentially use and how we interweave them is, is just as important as the Kotaro that we're having today. How we use that data and interweave them with other data sources. And that includes everything from mataronga, uh, you know, to, to satellite data, to acoustic data, to metabolomic data and traditional species surveys as we do them um, currently. It requires us to do a bit of futures thinking and indeed this document, uh, the long term insights briefing um, that Department of Conservation I was involved in writing this has a big section on environmental DNA and um, I didn't put that in there, it was there before I started at Department of Conservation because it's really making um, a technique is really making a difference in how we listen to nature and how we keep score. So if we can use, um, you know, all of these tools um, at our disposal. Um, we can get much better at measuring complex biological systems well. We can track um, changes over time, cumulative impacts. We can potentially set limits that we're not happy more discharge going into that, into that river or into that environment because we can set limits. For instance, ticky limits that we showed previously. We can understand the muri, the life force, the interconnections um, at place. Um, what, what species are aligned in anything? These networks out there, you know, these, these environments out there are one great big social networks with interconnections, lines that draw between things. And we, in these techniques, we have the ability to draw lines between those taxa and, and see which ones, uh, what happens when you take things out of ecosystems, when we have extinctions or silent extinctions, what occurs to the ecological integrity of those systems. We can optimize restoration efforts. Um, there's lots of different ways that you might look at restoring ecosystems. Which ones work the best and why? When is it time to reintroduce species back to an area because now what they eat is now um, present at that location. We can prioritize. This is a major kicker through working through central government. There is so much to do in the conservation and environmental space. But not all priorities are, are equal. Not all of the stuff needs to be done now. Maybe we're dropping the ball on some urgent stuff that needs to be done. Um, and that needs to be further up the list. If we can't keep score and understand why and justify why we're doing this conservation effort in this location and not this one at this point in time, um, you know, it's, it's, it makes life very difficult because we can't justify it. We know we can't be all the places all the time doing all the things, but we can certainly do better than what we're currently doing at the moment. And a, a link to that, of course, is the final one in there is making good decisions. Um, it's fundamental, you know, we are left with the legacy that decisions, environmental decisions that people have put into our, into our laps from, from decades or, or centuries ago when they introduced species um, that are now huge um, issues to us. We can make good decisions about incursions into lake alligator weed that might turn up in a lake for a first area. It'll be a hell of a lot easier to remove it early than it would be to do it um, five years from now. Um, when it's got out of control. So those sort of decisions can save us money and they can um, they can be at the benefit of Tataio. So while you know environmental DNA and will become more powerful as a um, as a tool, especially as we build better reference databases, it is a really big hammer that we can use to to tackle some gnarly environmental and conservation problems in New Zealand. But it is still a toolkit approach and we need to interweave the other tools into that um, and, and 
and use all of them collectively to, to make really good um, decisions about what tool we use in what order and when. So final thought is that really the pathway into the holistic monitoring is navigated with, with robust databases um, that can link barcodes to species. But I stress the point, there's lots we can do at the current this current point in time, but things will get better when we have them. And um, if we get, I guess, the right um, framework around it about um, how we sample, what, what permissions we need, how we govern that data, and how we share that data nationally and internationally, um, we'll be in a better place for it. And I'll just leave you the final thought that, um, you know, we were doing some work on um, subterranean, you know, environments and looking at, at, at work and um, our only ability to identify many of New Zealand's taxa currently um, comes from data that was generated overseas that we use um, because we haven't got good reference data at genus level. So they won't be the same species that live in Aotearoa New Zealand, but the genus or families are there and we can identify what they are. And as we get into more and more obscure environments, such as subterranean environments, that very much becomes, um, that becomes critical. So um, kia ora everyone, and I'll stop sharing and thank you for your time. Good, Mike. Thanks so much for your excellent presentation and um, thanks to all the other presenters today as well. Um, if everyone could find um, the reactions tab and give a round of applause for the presenters, um, that would be, wait, that's not it, that's uh, it's the clap one. There we go. Thanks everyone. That was an excellent round of, um, of presentations. Thanks everybody. And um, so that, that concludes the presenting uh, part of this, of this wānanga. Um, and leads us to the next stage, which is the Q and A session. And I'm sure um, everyone's got lots of lots of questions. Um, there's some great ones that have been popping up in the chat. Thanks very much to everyone for posting those. Um, if you think of any, feel free to um, put them in the chat, and we can discuss. Um, I thought we could get straight into um, jo Joelle's questions, um, which are very important ones um, at the at the top of the chat. There, um, Joelle asks, uh, how can the fucker papa of data back to uh, to mana whenua be maintained through metadata when metadata categories are often set by whole of government mandates. Um, I wonder if Joelle, are you still on the on the call? If you are um, interested in expanding on that at all and, and giving the um, the audience a bit more context around your question. Mm. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Thank you. Okay, great. Sorry, um, I can't uh, use my video because I'm I'm blocked from video showing you my face, but that's um, probably a good thing. Um, so my question is: All data has a fucker papa back to mana whenua and back to a whenua, and there's just so much rich information that comes um, through Matoranga. But when all of the metadata categories don't reflect Tao Māori, then I feel that it's very difficult to preserve those links. Does that make sense? So um, I wonder if I can, you can see me now. Is that, is that better if you can see what I look like? Um, <laughs> so for example, um, I work for Fisheries New Zealand, Tania Tangaroa, and we store our research on uh, Niwa databases. But all of the categories, when you when you look at them, they say things like data custodian, but it doesn't say kaitiaki. So mm -hmm. if, for example, an iwi research institute wants to look at that data and see, you know, how many kaitiaki um, have done X kind of research, all of that information just can't be conveyed. And um, so that's my question. I'm happy to have a first go at responding to that one, Joel. Um, mm. If that's right, and sorry, I called you Jody in the chat. I've got my, I've got the wrong glasses on. I haven't got my reading glasses on. <laughs> um, no so it's a, it's a really good question, and there's there's actually a couple of kind of dynamics to it. Um, the first one is, and I, I I've been kind of itching to say this for some time during the court at all, but. Any reference database, any eDNA reference database, to my mind, or at least the advice I'm going to be giving, is that it requires the full prior and informed consent of hapu and iwi interests, relevant hapu and iwi interests, 
to load anything that's collected from their relevant rohe or takiwa or tribal area of interest into such said reference database. So the database itself, is, if it's to be tetriti informed and led or guided, needs that you know that prerequisite. There needs to be full prior and informed consent. Now, part of that is that there needs to be clarity around what the reference database might be used for move, moving forward. So that's so that's one aspect. That kind of then raises the question for you. Well, how do you how do you then identify in the metadata um, that there is an you know that who the relevant hapu or iwi interest is? I mean, this is one aspect of it only, and it's just one aspect. Um, there are ways, and there there is a there is a an initiative on the go. You might have heard about it. It's not the only solution, but it's the um, what's been referred to as the traditional knowledge and biocultural labels. But essentially, all, all that is, is a is kind of a column, if you like, in the metadata, where you can say something about the relevant hapu and iwi or iwi interest in that specimen or um, to which that you know metadata relates. It doesn't actually need to be a biocultural label. Crown Research Institutes right now could just add, I know, I know it's not this simple, but you could theoretically simply add a column into the Excel or C, you know, um, CRS file, whatever it is that um, houses all the metadata that allows you to say that there are relevant hapu or iwi interests and these are who they are based on what's publicly available. The Te Kahui Mangai website, which is a publicly available website, has all those tribal areas of interest included in it. So if you have a geospatial backend to your database, you could you could do that tomorrow. Um, now that's not to say that the Te Kahui Mangai website and tribal areas of interests interests aren't contestable. There are a, there's a huge degree of overlap, but it's a starting point for saying Taihua. There's a indigenous interest here in this specimen. You need to first talk to A or A, B, and C before you go any further. Um, that's my first go at that, responding to your question, Joel. I hope that helped. Yeah, others might have some fakaro on that space, though. Oh, Kira Holden, I could jump in briefly. Sorry, I can't share my video. My video seems to be stopped as well, like some people. Uh, Steve Borson here from um, Te Kura Nahiri School of Forestry at University of Canterbury. Um, just to follow up on that around having that identifier in uh, whatever spreadsheet it is that allows you to link back to mana whenua, I haven't seen some people on the call today like Waitangi Wood. I know there's lots of people here, so I'm missing people on the screen. But in another aspect of bioheritage through the Narako Takitaki, uh, Waitangi is co-leading an area where they are developing a database that links uh, mana whenua through cultural authority agreements. Um, so that you know there is an infrastructure there now in place to ensure that if the tool is used, say the reference database is scoured for you know what species is this, there's a way then of sending back to any relevant mana whenua. Uh, so they're building that tool now uh, through through Narako Takitaki. So Waitangi Wood is one of the co-leads on that. Many thanks, um, both Holden and Steve, for your, your um, comments there. Um, I would note as well that the next um, webinar um, in May that's going to be held um, in this series is um, about Māori perspectives on the use of DNA data. So we can um, definitely get right right into more detail um, during the May one, but absolutely happy to um, to discuss this now because I think it is one of the most, what well, is the most important um, topic that we have to to. Um, work through to get this database up and running. So I um, really appreciate your, your question there, Joelle, as well. And, and Joelle had a second a second follow-up question as well, um, which was, how does Matauranga inform reference databases and how is Māori data governance maintained in those cases? And I think that, that's already been um, um, kind of semi-addressed already, but um, if anyone would like to jump on and, and address that as well. Right. 
if um, if if everyone's um, satisfied with that at the moment, um, we can we can certainly park that topic and and really get into it um, in the next next webinar in a month's time. So um, yeah, I, really, had, really, I had yeah. one quick question, Sean, and, and I know Holden's talked about this briefly before, but it, obviously mm -hmm. there's there's quite a lot of data in reference databases already for New Zealand taxa and species. Just um, what uh, thoughts on processes going forward? Uh, um, you yeah. know about what we should do in, in that space this, and obviously it's a it's a long long road ahead to get to the right right space but i'll have another go and then others might want to contribute as well but this is the challenge it's the legacy it's the legacy systems that you would want to attach to any future reference database where the data or the the material has been collected uh in less than fully informed ways in terms of hapu and iwi interests so it's how how do you address that legacy issue in some ways you kind of have to have a full-on conversation before you well well you do in my view before you put anything into a new frame framework if you like into a new reference database you have to have a conversation with and i i know this is is, is a challenge but with nga iwi katoa o te motu you know, because, yeah, um, I don't know if that has answered the question, but um, others might want to have a go. We have um, Philip Wilcox um, has a hand up, if you'd like to jump on. Oh, kia ora, <clears throat> kia ora koutou, uh, nga mihi nunui, kia ora koutou, e ngai, e ngā tangata takitaki, uh, me ngā tangata uh, kaipūtua, <clears throat> kua tai mai nei, kia ora ki konei. Um, Ke whakautua um, e pāanga um, ngā pātai e kei runga ngā tātou. Um, so just answering, I guess, or answering that question to a certain extent around ngā tauranga and also adding to um, um, Hohaia's um, <coughs> um, Holden, sorry, um, presentation, um, or comments just there. So First of all, you know, one of the things that I've felt is that with Māori, Māori traditional environmental knowledge that where it still exists and where it's willing to be shared provides a uh, an opportunity for, I guess, gold standard um, information for particularly for um, certain species and also in terms of what might a pristine environment look like. Um, and so that information actually helps with study design. For example, you know, talking to some of um, um, Kaitiaki from from Omapiri, um, and they had some um, eDNA samples taken, um, and they couldn't see any evidence of tuna DNA, um, but they know they're there and they know what their populations are like, um, et cetera, et cetera. So clearly, the sampling strategy was not adequate. Um, for detecting species that are there. And of course, those are people who heard um, Diane Gleason's presentation um, at the eDNA conference in Hobart. There was a, an example she gave, it was kind of hilarious, where um, she, they were looking for turtle DNA in a pool. And there was a picture of this pool with a turtle on the side of the pool, but there was no eDNA <laughs> presence of, detected or, or no presence of the turtle detected in the eDNA. So clearly, you know, hundreds of years, or in the case of um, Australia, tens of thousands of years of environmental knowledge surely has some benefit in this place and space. And uh, but how is it protected? Um, the you know the you know, what you know, and the strategy is tikanga, um, and tikanga is quite flexible. So there's not necessarily one size fits all in terms of the in terms of how it works. Um, but we're in the Rake Order project where we're protecting um, people's DNA information um, in their health records. We have same platform, but different governance um, opportunities and mechanisms to, that are that are pop that are, that are that are group specific. And those groups could be hapu, or they could be groups of affected um, 
patients, et cetera, et cetera. And I noticed Nick um, Jones, my Fanonga from Kaunun is here, and he can perhaps talk more to that because they're putting together that platform. So the tools are possible. To, to, they may need to be bespoke tools to incorporate tikanga. But the first thing you have to do is get the tikanga right first. And that's really what Holden is saying here, in my view, is that tikanga, before you have mātauranga, you have to have tikanga. You know, and for 20 something years, we have worked on tikanga frameworks and put them out into the science community and um, have been perpetually ignored um, for the most part. But, the, but where we do implement tikanga frameworks, what I do know is that the research projects work well and they work well for the scientists involved, um, not just the communities. So it's not a dichotomy. It doesn't compromise data quality. It doesn't compromise study design quality, and it does not compromise um, scientific reputations either. Um, and I can go into a lot more detail about that. Also, we have one other thing to say, and this is about your talk, Mike, um, where you talked about three is it three thousand species and the ticker index. Um, there have been Maori frameworks around around our health. Um, as well as um, around environmental health. I'm thinking of Kepa Morgan's Modi model, and I'm thinking of Gail Tipper's model as well, which have been in use for quite some time. And I'm sort of sitting there thinking, well, why aren't we talking about using those in terms of um, assaying our environmental health? Because when they are done, when they are applied, most of the issues that um, that that undermine the modi and the mana of our tile are immediately identified or identifiable. So I just want to point out that those things are already in existence and why aren't we already using those is my question. So anyway, those are hopefully an answer and some statements and a, perhaps a bit of an um, introduction to what I might be talking about in the next month. Kia ora. Kia ora, Philip. Thank you so much for your comments. And um, I think there's quite a, quite a few people on this call, myself included, who would love to to learn more about um, what, what you what you're what you're saying. Do you um, are you able to point audience in in any direction of some some pre reading that we could get get under our belts before your presentation next month? Um, and if so, would you be um, interested in sharing that with us on the on the chat? Uh, sure. Yeah. No. There's um. There's a there's a lot of research frameworks that have been put together, and that they the these Maori research frameworks um, have you know some of it is working with Maori, some of it is is working um, collaboratively, and some of it is sort of working like Kopapa Maori theory and things like that. Um, there's a lot of there's case studies. There's a whole range of literature that's already sits out there. And the other thing I perhaps should, and so I'd be happy to share those. I mean, I've got presentation, I give lectures on this stuff in, in science papers at, 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 in Otago. Um, the other thing I'll say too, is that these frameworks are from the experiences I've, I've had with our students. Our Pākehā students do really well. They're not difficult things to learn. They're not difficult things to um, try and get people put their heads around and maybe I can talk about and even show an example um, of how providing these frameworks and then some background in Te Ao Māori, particularly around tikanga, um, enables the students um, and the third and the second and third year students um, to recontextualize research proposals with a with 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 a Maori informed lens. I use the term Maori informed lens. It's not a well informed lens necessarily because these kids um, have come from Pākehā upbringings and back and backgrounds. But uh, the point being is that it's not hard when there's a will, there's a way, and we're now training these people to think in this way. So our big limitation is exactly what you've pointed out, Sean, which is. Um, the current genre of decision makers, kaiputaio, um, policy people, et cetera, et cetera, simply don't have that knowledge. Um, but they'll also question or not question whether or not within agencies, um, and, they, and by agencies, I mean the various funding agencies, journals, as well as institutions, whether or not there's a genuine will, 
um, because I've seen plenty of examples over the last 20 years where there's just been lip service paid to the, 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 the moderate efforts that have been made by a whole range of people, not, not just myself. So anyway, but I'm happy to post some stuff in the chat right now, if you like. Can I just add to what Phil said too, just, to, and I'm, I'm not trying to be cute here, but a, a little bit of pre-reading might be just to brush up on what Article 2 of Te Tiriti or Waitangi says, I, I and preferably the Te Reo Māori version, particularly the Te Reo Māori version, but both versions, particularly Article 2. Yeah, Article 2, is that's a really good point, Holden. Um, I'll be talking about that um, and, and, the, and the Te Ao Māori version is different to the Pākehā version when it comes to Tonga. Now the, now the question then becomes, whose version do we listen to um, or take note of? And I'm pretty sure our tūpuna didn't sign the Pākehā version. Anyway, let me go and post some stuff. Awesome. Kia ora, but that's, um, that's useful. I think um, there's a lot of people that would be really would um, would gain a lot from that um, coming into these these next round of conversations with a bit more um, a bit more context and knowledge. So um, that's that's greatly appreciated. Um, great. So we've got about another um, 10, 10 to fifteen minutes um, before the closing karakia. So um, John John has a hand up over here. I'd like to pass over to John. Hi, I'm John McKeown from Ag Research. And I um, basically work in a, a lot of species, but particularly overseas species. Uh, so this is a little bit about relevant about invasive species databases in particular, in other words, data from overseas being used by New Zealand researchers. Um, so uh, as a sort of anecdote, I'm sitting here looking at a paper I got sent today by a person from Senegal that I'm talking to tonight. And it's about, they've looked at four Senegalese sheep breeds and they've compared them to a sheep database of about 80 different breeds collected around the world that we published about 10 or 12 years ago. And it's basically the international database. Now this was collected with informed consent from the various parties. But if you uh, know anything about sheep, you'll know that there's certain countries like China and India that are very, very reluctant to release any data. But it's obviously of great value to New Zealand. And it's obviously of great value to this guy in Senegal who's got some native sheep breeds that are about four or 5,000 years old and are resistant to tryptomyosis. So in other words, international good. And I just want to emphasize, particularly when you're talking about databases of invasive species or a species from the rest of the world, in other words, 98% of the sequences, that you've got to think of them as well. And you've got to have these reference databases. The majority of the data is going to come from outside New Zealand. Okay. And this is very relevant to New Zealand's economic prosperity because about 70% of the GDP, or its export um, income, I should say, comes from species that are from overseas. So just remember that. And I want to add another little point as well. So we've got about, I don't know, um, well over a million DNA samples um, in storage. And we've done... Um, genotyping by sequencing on over 600,000 samples uh, already. Um, and most of those got DNA samples stored. And a lot of those nowadays actually come from rumen microbes. So we've got rumen microbe samples from sheep, cattle and stuff, not only from New Zealand, but overseas as well. And there's going to be a whole truckload of uh, sequences in there from all sorts of places. Now, we are reasonably brutal about how we do it, but we, we um, pretty much have found that we don't actually need to know what species they come from. We just use them as barcodes and analyze them as barcodes. We might have 400 or 500,000 barcodes from a, a rumen microbial profile, and we just use the counts and the barcodes. So I'm just putting that out there 
I'm trying to put this in a context that a lot of this is very inward focusing and that you should be looking from a, an international perspective about where New Zealand sits relative to the rest of the world because you guys are using a lot of databases from overseas and I haven't heard anything from anybody about how you use those publicly available databases. And we spent a lot of time when we set up, set up the Sheep and Cattle International databases about 10 or 12 years ago on that aspect. Kia ora, John. I might, I might just um, just have, I've just got one comment to follow up from that. I, I hear what you're saying. And of course, overseas data and material being added to the uh, any reference database. I mean, I can't, I can't comment on that aspect of it, but whether it's invasive, exotic, indigenous or endemic, if it was sampled, collected or measured here in Aotearoa, then Te Tiriti o Waitangi applies to the protocols we need to put in place for such a reference database. So, um, yeah, I'll just make that point. But yeah, I, I, I take your point about uh, material that might get added from overseas um, sources. Would anyone else like to um, to have a go at addressing um, John's uh, John's questions there? Phil, you should have a go. <laughs> I, mean, I was well, just thinking in the in the putting, context putting reference of, material into our uh, chat. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking in the context of biosecurity and in particular Anastasia's talk on marine biosecurity. I mean, there's similar there's some alignment there as well. Well, it's actually incredibly important to have those sequences from overseas species that aren't here yet because we're you know it's that and there'll be other examples I'm sure in the in the terrestrial biosecurity you know it's what it's knowing what are the the potential species that are arriving in um in New Zealand and I guess we often rely on international groups to to um sequence those for us but you know it's a, it's another question is should we be looking at what the top 50 biosecurity pests are and, and making sure they're in our in our databases and how do we do it, go about that when we have to resource that material from from overseas so yeah I think there's some some uh, interesting questions to think about there and yeah and I can see um Shane's got his, his hand up there as well yeah so in the uh, context of the the border um and the, the CITES material uh, this conference I went to in Oregon back in October, there was a lot of frustration expressed by basically everybody that was there from, from all over the world about the, the availability of data on specific species and um, accessing it from outside of the, the particular nations where those species were, uh, were endemic. Um, and it's not, a, it's not a solved problem. And you know, much as it's uh, it's important to the people within those countries uh, that, that this data be handled in a particular way, if you're trying to protect endangered species and prevent the trafficking, that data still needs to be available. So we need to get past this, this um, who owns it and this siloing of data that does happen. And so um, just being able to find the data um, and as I, as I mentioned, the, the provenance of it, who, who collected it, how was it collected, are we sure that that, that was the correct sample? And, and so at ESR, for instance, we've, we've been discussing with uh, museums and zoos in New Zealand, can we get access to this material so that we have a reference ourselves that we can then use? Um, and, and particularly for dealing with, um, with material that's being processed like that, you, you have to be able to say, well, here's a fresh sample we can sequence that we know we know what we're looking for now we can take the sample that's come through the border and is highly degraded can we process that and do we do we still get the right answer does it actually match the the fresh sample and so it, it is a big problem um and with thirty eight thousand endangered species um I, I don't think there's an easy answer to it at the moment um but certainly having to deal with it on a case by case basis so for instance as i say the the, the ivory sample that came in uh we knew how to deal with that but then if you get some chinese medicine that comes in that could be who knows what um then then it turns into a bit of a fishing expedition really and then you're looking at much more like metagenomics and and 
and having access to material uh, that's referenced from other countries is important. Um, and those other countries are going to need access to our reference material. It, absolutely. And a, a case of point about that is um, our little mud snail, Potamopergus, um, which has made its way into um, America and is just causing huge, huge problems over there. Um, so while we have a lot of uh, invasive species visiting our shores, we, we also tend to provide a few as well. Um, and so making that data um, available to those those people who are trying to control that in, in other parts of the world is, is going to be critical as well. So um, yeah, much, much appreciate your thoughts. Thank you, Shane. Well, we have um, around two more minutes. If anyone wants to to ask any more questions, we we had um, one uh, a couple of quick questions in the chat around. Um, uh, Alison asked one about um, reanalyzing e e DNA or eDNA in the future. Where is all the eDNA and DNA samples stored, and how how do other people access them? Um, which is a is a quite a um, a complicated question, really, because. Um, the answer is um, they're in a lot of freezers. <laughs> um, they're in CRIs, they're in universities, they're in private labs and everything. So um, it's probably something that we want to think about going forward, I think, as well, is, those, is not just data and who owns it, but also about the samples themselves and, and where do they go and how do they get treated. So um, we might we might not have time to, to go into um, super detail here, but just want to flag um, for perhaps a future session there, that, that's still something to think about. So would anyone else like to, to throw anything out in the last minute? Um, so anything super quick before we um, hand over to Holden for the, for the closing karakia? Sean, um, I would just like to make a, a parting note. And I think they, the conversations that we're having today, this is exactly the forum for them. We want to hear all the perspectives going into this effort because we want to make sure that we're not just developing a resource for use today or tomorrow. We are developing a resource that's going to be serving the next generations and the generations after them. So our reliance on international resources, our own obligations to Tetiriti and, and that being one of the laws of our land are, are both opposing but really important parts for this type of work. So thank you everyone for contributing these um, kopapa. And I think this is an evolving discussion. This is the very first um, Wananga in a series that we are organizing. So hopefully there will be more opportunity to bring up these and other issues that we need to think about as a collaborative uh, group. Um, so I think that's, that's really all I just wanted to part with that this has been really, really fascinating and interesting to hear. Um, and I really just also wanted to thank all of our speakers today and our facilitators and everybody else who participated and made time for this Kopapa. And yeah, hopefully we can keep this engagement ongoing with the uh, upcoming um, seminars as well. And there will be a list posted. We'll send out um, invitations and um, also more further information for the next um, as Wananga in the series, which will be hosted by Nathan Kenny and Lana Alexander, and will be specifically on the topic of Māori perspectives, perspectives on EDN. And I know there's been some discussion already ongoing in the chat about it. So hopefully most of you all can make to make it make your time to come to that as well. Um, and yeah, once again, just thanks everyone for coming along today and participating. And I will hand over now to Holden for the um, karakia. Kia ora. Kia ora, men print o tira kia ora koutou katoa, ka nui te mihi atu ki a koutou, e tika ana te kōrero, ko ranga tira katoa tātou i tā koutou taitanga mai uh, i tēnei rangi ki te uh, tuku kōrero, tuku whakaaro e pāna ki tēnei kaupapa whakahirahira rawa atu. Hari te mea mō ngā hapu me ngā iwi anake, engari mō ngā i tātou katoa. Tangata Triti Mai, Tangata Fenua Mai, Nareida, Kaiti Mihiatu and Kiakoto Katoa, Hueno, Haifaka Kapi, Tota Dai Hui, Katakinehe, Paku Karakia, Nareida, Kote Pu, Kote Pu, Kote Kauru, Kaiti Hia Hia, Kaiti Koroma, Koromo Matane, Tu Ramarama Inuku, Tu Ramarama Irangi, Terangi Etu, Te Papa Etakoto, Kunga Tawiro Tene Wananga, Fakamau, 
whakamau ki ngā kōreroa iho, ngā kōreroa iho ki te wānanga, ki te whaiao, ki te aomārama, tūnuturu o whiti whakamaua ki a tīna. Au mie, mie, tāi. Tāi ki. 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 T